Coming. I'm Jackie Nelson from the School of Behavioral and Brain Sciences, and um, today we're going to be talking about children's emotional competence. Before we start talking about children, I want us all to take a minute to reflect on our own lives and what emotional competence means to us. Um, and I think this can provide a good perspective about how important these early emerging skills are, not just in childhood, but throughout children's 
entire lives as they develop. Um, so what I'd like you to do, close your eyes if you'd like, I'd like you to think of uh, a situation, an interaction within the last week that you had where you had an emotional reaction. Any sort of emotional reaction, positive, negative, intense, more subtle. Any sort of interaction you found yourself in where you had this emotional reaction to something. Could be an argument, could have been something where you were really happy, you heard great news. Does everyone have something in mind? I'm going to list a few questions, and I want you to keep this in mind and kind of reflect back on that experience. So you had an emotional reaction, but were you able to pinpoint exactly how you felt at the time? Did you say, oh, I know I was just ecstatic to hear that news, or I know I was upset, but I can't quite pinpoint if it was because I was more angry or disappointed? So was there also a sense of justification for why you felt that way? Did you feel like... These emotions I felt were completely appropriate in this situation. I had every right to be angry. Or did you feel like maybe you exaggerated it just a bit? Now, did, also, the last thing I want to ask is, did you experience some closure or understanding at the end of the, the event or situation? Or did you leave feeling like, I just didn't get what I wanted out of that situation? Just didn't accomplish what I set out to do? So I think when we can reflect back on our own emotional experiences and ask these sort of questions to ourselves, we can get an idea about how emotional competence either facilitates or hinders social interactions in our own lives. And I think, so clearly these are important skills that we take with us throughout life, and I think it's really interesting to examine how they just start to emerge in childhood. These are, these are complex and pretty challenging skills for young children. So let's break down what emotional competence is. Here's a set of skills I'm going to read through pretty quickly, and then I'm going to go through each one in more detail. So we need to be aware of our own emotional states, being able to identify and label how we're feeling inside. We need to be able to understand other people's emotional states. We want to be able to express and communicate our emotions, but do so appropriately and effectively. We want to have the capacity to feel empathy for other people when they are in distress. We need to be able to regulate ourselves, right, when we get, well, experience really high positive or really negative emotions. Um, but typically this is more difficult for kids with negative emotions, so being able to regulate and cope with my distress. And then finally, have an understanding and be able to use display rules, or what's been called emotional dissemblance. And that's when we feel something on the inside, but we show people something different on the outside. And as you notice with that list, it got a bit more complex as we move down. So right now we're going to start with something that is um, a pretty basic emotion understanding skill that very young preschoolers start to gain. And this is just your ability to identify and understand your own emotional states. And this requires some self-reflection like we all just did, which means we have to be self-aware and, and know that we are an independent person. And that sounds pretty simple to us. But that's actually not something that children understand until about a year and a half to two years of age, just to give us a developmental time frame here. So how do we know this occurs around this period? Well, just anecdotally, most parents will probably tell you this is around the time when they notice their child recognized him or herself in the mirror around a year and a half or two. We also know this empirically. Michael Lewis has done a number of experiments on self-awareness and social emotions. What he's done is really quite interesting and innovative. He'll put a, um, a mark on children's forehead, so makeup or something like that, put them in front of a mirror, and in about a year and a half or two, children will wipe it off their own forehead. Before that time, they're going to reach to the mirror to wipe that off, right? So that's interesting. Um, so if we need to be self-aware to reflect on our own emotional state, it makes sense that if that doesn't occur until about a year and a half or two, we're going to start being able to identify and label our own emotional states maybe around two or three years old, so late toddlerhood. Typically, children are able to under, have an understanding of happiness first, and then later on they start to kind of differentiate some of those negative emotions, so sadness versus anger versus fear. So now a slightly more complex understanding of emotions is being able to understand other people's emotional internal states. So this means we want to understand both verbal and nonverbal features of emotions, so we get some cue as to how another person's feeling. And then we want to understand the causes and consequences of emotions to understand um, the appropriate situations in which they occur. This could be as simple as recognizing that another child 
feel sad if they're sitting down moping and crying in the corner. But it could be a lot more complex, too. A more complex understanding would be, under, be a recognition that someone can feel different even when they're in the same situation as you. So, for example, a child and a friend are approached by a large, friendly dog. Maybe the child likes dogs and feels happy in that situation, but she knows that her friend is very scared of dogs and feels very fearful. So understanding that, that I can be in the same situation as another person and they might feel very different than I do, have a different reaction. Now, early childhood, interestingly, is characterized by an incredible amount of egocentrism. And that just means that I'm not yet able to take the perspective of another person. I think everybody sees things and thinks about things the way that I do. This is The classic example of this is if you're talking to a two- or three-year-old on the phone and you ask them a question and they nod their head to respond to you, not knowing that you have a different visual perspective than they do. You're not able to see them answer you like that. Uh, but during the preschool years, this is a time when children start to gain some of these perspective-taking abilities. And that's incredibly important here if we want to understand another person's emotional state, being able to take another person's uh, emotional, cognitive perspective. Now, to assess this more advanced uh, emotion understanding in a lab setting, we've asked preschool-age children to identify reasons why another person, in this case a puppet on the hand, uh, would feel certain ways. So I'll show you an example of a four-year-old child. At, um, and this is a nice illustration, I think, of emerging skills. You'll see that she is able to... Um, to understand this a bit, and then there are times when she gets, especially those negative emotions, a little bit confused. So let's take a look. And I apologize, the volume is a little low and muffled, but if we stay really quiet, I think we'll be okay. This is about three minutes long, too, just to warn you. What else did they Yeah, all right. 
So that's a great example of. Did you notice the sad and mad? She gave an example for sad and then th- or for mad, and then thought, no, maybe it feels sad. No, mad. I'm not quite sure. And then a lot of her examples for sad or were probably more. You probably would feel more angry in those examples. And then by the end, maybe she just ran out of ideas and was was done with that game. So a good a good illustration of kind of these emerging skills. All right, we also need to be able to appropriately express our emotions. So that's both um, not, not just verbal expressions, but nonverbal too. Nonverbal expressions of anger and frustration can be incredibly difficult and challenging for young children. But appropriate expression allows kids to communicate how they feel in a socially appropriate way that doesn't harm themselves or others or their relationships. And to do that, we need to have some sort of emotional vocabulary, be able to use emotion words to tell people how we're feeling. And even many toddlers can use pretty basic emotion words, but often these includes, include words that um, reference behaviors or actions instead of internal states, so talking about crying instead of feeling sad inside. Um, but it, So it's not until about the end of the, well, I would say about the beginning of the preschool years, children become much more skillful at understanding emotion words, but tend not to use them or produce them as much in their vocabulary until around the end of the preschool years. Uh, so if we know that being able to communicate our feelings and our needs helps decrease children's frustration and challenging situations, uh, it, this really can serve as a great regulatory strategy for kids, being able to communicate. Use your words when you're upset. Communicate how you're feeling. So what is the biggest predictor of a child um, being an effective emotion communicator? It's parents talking about emotions and being interested in children's emotions. So it just is an opportunity for children to talk about emotions, know that somebody cares about how I'm feeling, and I've got a safe space to communicate about that. Okay, we also want to be able to be empathetic towards other people when they are in distress. And when we, when we encounter someone who is upset, we may respond in a number of different ways. Empathy can be described as feeling with other people. And this has been talked about as a moral emotion. And typically, we have a sense of personal responsibility or a, a motivation to help relieve that individual's distress. Sympathy can be described as feeling for others instead of feeling with others. So here we may have some motivation to help decrease the other person's distress, but maybe not. There's definitely not as much personal responsibility intertwined in that as there is with empathy. And then maybe we don't feel empathetic or sympathetic when somebody is in distress. Maybe we become upset or a personal distress reaction. And that can be described as feeling for yourself. And here, this is when we become upset as a result of witnessing somebody else's distress. And our main motivation in that situation is to relieve our own personal distress and just get out of that situation. What's an example of this? Uh, changing the channel or turning the TV off when you see that terribly sad Sarah McLaughlin ASPCA ad, <laughs> right? Or maybe um, taking another route to work to avoid an intersection where you know a homeless mother typically is at. Uh, so some scientists suggest this tendency to react with personal distress instead of empathy or sympathy is a sign of immaturity or egocentrism. But other scientists have suggested that it's possible this could just be a common response when we, there, isn't just any, there isn't anything we can do. Uh, we, the situation is just out of our control. We aren't really able to help. In terms of a developmental progression, the first thing that might come to mind is when very young infants start crying, when another baby next to them starts crying, and then you eventually have a room of 15 wailing babies. And a lot of people ask, is that a first sign of empathy? Are young infants empathetic because they cry when picking up on other, other infants' responses? And this very well may be an early precursor to empathy because we do have to be able to notice another person's distress and see that as salient in our environment to be empathetic. But true empathy really does require self-awareness like we talked about, so a self distinguished from others, and that ability to take another person's perspective. 
So the ability to figure out the emotional state of another person. And then, of course, there's that affective component of taking on those emotions yourself. But that's why empathy is typically studied during the preschool years because of the necessity to have this perspective-taking ability. Well, I think a lot of parents want to know um, what makes a child more empathetic. Where do we, what types of children tend to use these responses more than others? Well, research has generally shown that children who are um, expressive in social situations, so they're comfortable with emotions, children who are assertive, and kids who have good regulatory and attention skills tend to be those that use those pro-social behaviors more often. Additionally, parents who are empathetic and who are accepting of their kids' emotions tend to have kids who use these empathetic responses more often. So it's a basic modeling moral behavior here, and then also being accepting of kids' emotions so that they get the message that it's okay to express emotions and to feel for another person. Okay. So next we need to be able to regulate ourselves when we become distressed. Um, emotion regulation and self-regulation are two terms that are often talked about. Emotion regulation here refers to the ability to manage your own um, subjective emotional experience, so both the intensity and the duration, and then also being able to strategically manage how you express those emotions in a social context. So regulating your internal state and externally how that appears to other people. Self-regulation is often discussed um, a bit more broadly, and this is the ability not just to regulate your feelings, but also your actions and your thoughts in a flexible way across context, so whether that's social or behavioral context too. So sitting still in the classroom when you're in first grade. Regulation implies that there's some control exerted by the individual, and in some cases that regulation can be very purposeful, but it can also be somewhat unintentional too. Even infants use regulatory acts, even if we believe they're automatic or reflexive in nature. And you may have some regulatory acts that you use often that now become automatic to you as well. So maybe when you become scared, you start to breathe slower and deeper to kind of calm yourself down. There are a few coping strategies used by kids that I'd like to mention here. This isn't an exhaustive list, um, but I have a short video clip of a child using some of these strategies. So I think it's nice to discuss them and then illustrate them a bit. So children might use problem-solving regulatory strategies when they're faced with a challenge. They may use support seeking, so this is seeking help or assistance or comfort from another person. They might use distancing or avoiding just to distract themselves from a task or, or remove it from out of sight, out of mind. Right? Or they may use internalizing or externalizing strategies. An internalizing strategy might be um, ruminating on the task. So, I just can't do this, I'm not any good at this, what am I going to do? And externalizing might not be acting on yourself, but acting out towards other people. So um, I'm frustrated, and instead of being able to regulate or control, I'm going to hit, hit my buddy. So the clip we're going to watch, I think, is a nice illustration of a very young preschooler. This is a three-year-old uh, in a frustrating situation and attempting to, to regulate. The task um, needs to be frustrating for kids. So much so, frustrating for all kids, too, for an extended period of time. So what that means is that we end up having to make a task that's impossible to complete, which sounds pretty mean, but that's the only way we can make sure this is frustrating for everybody for an extended period. So one example of these frustration tasks, the ones we're, one we'll look at here, is when you have a desirable toy for the child, put it in a clear plastic box and lock it up, and then we give children a ring of keys and ask them to try to find the right key to unlock the box. Well, the kicker is not only is it hard for the three-year-olds to use the keys in, with a lock, the correct key is not even on the ring of keys. I know, we're so mean. Um, but uh, we want to make sure that children get frustrated and see how they handle that situation. This, typically, I'm not going to show you all three minutes, but typically these tasks only last for three minutes, and especially with the younger kids. If they really start to lose it, we, of course, intervene. Um, Mom is uh, in the, the room, That's you should realize on the clip, Mom, someone will be talking back. That's Mom. She's in the room because these kids were younger. And we ask parents to respond in a, a designated way because we want to make sure they don't get involved in the task. So you'll hear Mom respond the exact same way every time, and that's because we've told her to do that. Okay, so let's take a look. And think of some of those strategies we talked about while you watch this. Oh, I not want to do that.
So as you can see, she was seeking help from her mom. Uh, she was using some distancing and avoiding, right? Put that box on the table, and then she seemed to be a little calm, more calm after that. Those two strategies seemed to be pretty effective for her. She didn't get really upset about the task. She did use some problem solving, but unfortunately that's not a real effective strategy in this case because the task is impossible to complete. Um, and then we also saw a little bit of externalizing, maybe, kind of the box sort of slammed on the table, but not, not to a very strong degree, though. Okay, so the last thing here is understanding display rules and being able to use them. And remember, I mentioned that was emotional dissemblance, so I can feel one way on the inside and I can show you something different on the outside. So again, this is just for a definition, the ability to realize that my internal emotional state doesn't need to correspond with my outer expression, both in myself and in other people. And at a more mature level, it's an understanding that um, a mismatched internal state and external state can actually um, have a positive impact on another person, depending on the situation. So it's motivation to control my self-presentation. Self so who makes the rules? Well, rules for appropriate emotional expression can be dictated by cultural norms, uh, cultural, cultural conventions, or by personal coping needs. What do I need to do to get through this situation? So cultural display rules are just these social conventions that prescribe um, how we should express ourselves, what feelings we should express to others. These are generally agreed upon by members of the culture or society, and they permit smooth, predictable interactions between people. One great example is what we have here in this picture, and that's kind of our social rule that if you get a gift, even if you don't like it, you should act like you do. <laughs> Put a smile on your face. A personal display rule is more individualized, and um, this serves a more personal function of hiding our true feelings in order to make ourselves feel better or to look better to other people. So one example of this mismatch might be when um, a boy is being teased and tries to act like he doesn't care to appear, appear strong even though he's quite hurt on the inside. So that would be a way to cope through a situation and put a different, different face on the outside. So we can manipulate that outside expression. So I feel runway, but I manipulate how, what I show to you in a number of different ways. Children as young as two will often exaggerate their expression on the outside compared to what they feel on the inside to gain attention from other people. So we've all seen a young child be, get a little pushed by a sibling, and then it's a theatrical howl and everything, right? So that's an example of exaggerating that external expression. By the early preschool years, children tend to be socialized by adults to minimize and dampen their emotional expressions. And later, they're able to regulate themselves enough to actually uh, neutralize or substitute an expression that's different from what they're feeling. So smiling in a situation where you feel incredibly embarrassed. Okay. So, as I talk through this, you might start to be thinking about how these are pretty complex skills for a young child to feel one way on the inside, regulate and show something different to other people that's socially acceptable. And obviously this requires a lot of complex skills. So first off, emotion knowledge that we talked about. So it's understanding how I feel on the inside and what is appropriate for certain emotional situations, causes and consequences of emotions. We have to have that cognitive representation and mental flexibility to understand what another person is going to think and feel about our expression. So again, it's that perspective taking ability. Also, and this, those of you familiar with theory of mind, this will come to mind when I say this, but you also need to have an understanding of apparent versus real reality. So my real reality is how I'm feeling on the inside, but I can put up an apparent reality um, that you will view, and those two can be different. Okay. Additionally, the child has to be motivated to manipulate their expression, and, and research has shown that the audience really does matter, so children tend to manipulate what you see on the outside more in front of their peers than they do in front of their parents, kind of a saving face type of strategy. <laughs> and then finally, as you can imagine, we need to be able to regulate, um, regulate our emotions so that we can stop that immediate emotional reaction and put on a different expression. So I, I think we've been talking throughout about why emotional competence is important, but let's talk about it in a slightly different way. 
just the ability to manage your emotional experience is a, is a great byproduct of having these skills. So emotion management refers to coping with both your internal emotional state and the outer self that you present to other people. Your ability to do this results in healthier psychological functioning if you feel like you have some control over your emotional experiences and tends to result in healthier relational um, functioning too. You uh, better understand other people's feelings, you can relate to their experiences, and you can manage your emotions in front of them to preserve uh, whatever sort of uh, interaction is, is going on at the time. Maybe it's a problem solving, negotiation, something like that. Likewise, we tend to just feel better about ourselves when we can effectively manage emotional challenges in our life. Uh, so we are, when we're efficacious enough to try new social situations because we feel confident we can handle new social challenges, that just increases our social emotional skills when we try out new things. Children are also better able to recover from um, risky situations or adversity when they have greater emotional coping skills. And being able to cope with frustration is part of that emotion regulation experience. Emotional competence is also incredibly important because it's linked to so many other aspects and domains of development. So obviously linked to social development, understanding other people, relating to them, feeling empathy for other people's distress, regulating my own frustration when I'm solving a problem with you. It's also related to cognitive development. So learning about other people's states and situations, um, being able to take the perspective of other people, the cognitive and emotional perspective. And then additionally, children are just better able to learn when they're able to regulate themselves behaviorally and emotionally. So think about kids trying to handle new behavioral and emotional demands when they enter primary school. I can't pay attention to the teacher when I'm um, upset about what happened on the playground and I'm moving around, right? And really, oh, and I should mention moral development as well. We talked about the ability to be empathetic for other people and, and respond in a moral way when other people are distressed. And really, all of these domains of development are linked together as well. So in one of my recent studies, my colleagues and I discovered that very early emotion understanding at around age three was related to better understanding of other people's mental states at age four. And then at age five, those same children had a better understanding of gratitude then. So understanding that um, whether an individual should be thankful if they receive a favor, whether I should repay the favor, and why should I do that. Those children had a better understanding when they had some of this foundation ahead of them. So understanding emotions and mental states, things like that. Okay. I'd like to talk briefly about what happens when children lack emotional competence. Emotional competence and psychopathology are associated in um, a number of different kinds of ways, and it really depends on what we're looking at. So um, individuals, uh, well, I should say if you have emotional competence, um, that can serve as a, as a buffer or protective factor, but if you lack emotional competence, it can put you at risk or make you more susceptible to psychopathology. So one example of this is if you are at risk for depressive symptoms and in addition to that you have very poor coping skills to handle different frustrations. Um, they, psychopathology and emotional competence are also associated in that emotional competence, a lack of emotional competence may actually lead to psychopathology or, or other problems like that. So one example is if uh, you lack the ability to relate to others that leads you to avoid social situations and then you end up developing anxiety in response, when you're put in social situations because you're not confident that you can navigate those successfully. A lack of emotional competence might also be a result of psychopathology or traumatic experience. So the example there is that uh, when a person disassociates because of a traumatic uh, experience that they had, disassociating from other people. Okay, I'd like to present just a few more um, research examples uh, looking at uh, ways in which emotional competence is lacking in different children. I list all the references here because these are not aspects that I study specifically, but I'd like you to have access to the resources so that you can look them up if you have further questions about these. So um, 
First, when we look at just having a lack of empathy and emotion understanding, this has been looked at in a number of different ways. Um, some researchers have examined emotion understanding and empathy in different groups of children, so a group of children with autism, a group of children with um, intellectual delays, and typically developing children. And what they tend to find is when all of these children are matched on cognitive level, only the group of children with autism were the ones that had difficulty with emotion understanding, so being able to identify other people's feelings, and with empathy. Remember we talked about how um, one of the precursors of empathy was that you, are, you recognize other people's emotions, that other people have feelings, and you understand that this is a salient thing in my environment that I should pay attention to. Maltreated and emotionally disturbed children also um, tend to have problems uh, understanding empathy in other people, but they are able to identify and label emotions. So they don't have as many problems with emotion understanding, but uh, tend to have difficulties uh, relating to and taking on the feelings of other people as a result of their traumatic experiences. Children who under-regulate or have difficulties regulating their negative emotions, as you might imagine, tend to, um, they tend to be very outward then with those, with those frustrations and anger. So they tend to um, be more aggressive, have problems with anger and violence. Recent research has revealed that uh, children can also over-regulate. So we before, we tended to think of regulation as a more is better type of thing. And now we're starting to see that kids can actually over-regulate too. And these are for kids that are not able to um, appropriately express their emotions. They feel like these need to be, or they've gotten socialization messages that these need to be suppressed and held inside. And over-regulation, we found, has um, been linked to anxiety problems later for these children, so more internalizing problems. Okay. And finally, I thought it was important to recognize um, children's environments and the powerful influence that, that parents can have, um, especially in terms of a, a modeling framework. When parents are particularly negative and have pretty hostile conflicts um, between one another, these children tend to have difficulty coping with their own negative emotions. So they haven't, um, had, haven't seen a great model for how to handle frustration appropriately and haven't probably received that support uh, to learn their own positive, constructive regulatory strategies. Okay. Emotion socialization is a term um, we use to talk about how kids learn about emotions. Typically this is looked at uh, with with parents, but I think we can extend this to teachers and really any caregiver. So how do kids learn about emotions? Well, we've already mentioned modeling. So parents or caregivers can model appropriate expression. They can model regulation strategies in front of a child when they get upset. They can model empathetic behavior. All of these are great contexts um, that have been shown to be pretty effective um, in terms of children's learning. Parents can also create an emotional climate in the home based on their own expressive behavior. So parents vary in terms of the amount of positive emotion they express and the amount of negative emotion they express. And in a recent study um, that we did, we actually found that mothers of preschoolers in our sample tended to follow one of three different expressive patterns. So we had moms that expressed or reported that they expressed a lot of positive emotion and very little negative emotion. We had another group that reported they expressed very low positive emotion and kind of average negative, so a low affect group. We had a group of moms that reported that they expressed a um, very high amount of negative emotion and average positive emotion, so a high affect group. And as you might guess based on our discussion of modeling, our high positive, low, low negative group of moms tended to have kids that expressed a lot of positive affect themselves. That was modeled to them. Their parents expressed a lot of uh, joy and happiness, and they did the same thing. And our group of very high negative moms, so a lot of emotional expression in general and very high negative, these kids tended to display more negative affect than kids in the other groups. And then our children of um, moms with very low positive expression and negative, uh, average negative expression, so a lower affect group, tended to have more difficulties regulating their emotions than kids in the other group. So these were kids that were not exposed to a lot of emotion in the home, and when they were, they might, we can guess, they might not have received the, um, the support and help to develop positive strategies because the, the emotions they were exposed to were, were negative emotions. 
How parents respond when children are upset right in the moment is incredibly powerful. And I know that's a scary thought because often that's the most inopportune times, right? You're in the grocery store and the child is, is screaming and you need to do a hundred other things and not stop and just attend to that child's emotions. But research has found over and over and over again that supportive responses to a child right in the moment um, is a really, really powerful socialization message. So children are learning, is my expression appropriate? Maybe it is, maybe it's not. Is my expression, is it okay for me to express these feelings? Um, what sort of situations can I express my negative emotions in? And what sort of feedback am I gonna get from the environment? And then also, if, par if a parent is attending to that child and helping them work through that, that experience in a constructive way, they're also learning regulatory strategies, too. Parents' responses to kids' native emotions or what uh, supportive responses have been also termed emotion coaching uh, are really predicted by parents' beliefs about whether children should display their negative emotions or not. And these beliefs have been found to be based on the cultural context. So what we find, for example, is that overt emotional expression tends to be linked to an orientation of individuality and independence, which is more characteristic of white Americans in the U.S., as opposed to a collectivist or more familial orientation, where emotions um, are more likely to be encouraged to be suppressed. Uh, these responses are also associated with parents' stress levels, as you can imagine. So in a study of parents of seven-year-olds, we found that father's um, marital stress and mom's stress at home with a crazy chaotic home environment were both related to less supportive responses when their kids were upset. In addition, uh, if a spouse was having stressful experiences at work, his or her partner was less likely to be supportive to children. So I think these findings just highlight the fact that uh, it takes patience to do this and parents' own emotional well-being, your own and your partner's well-being in order to be supportive to kids' negative emotions. Direct teaching can also be incredibly effective, especially for younger kids. So this could include you're reading a storybook and, um, or you're looking at a picture book and you actually stop to point out, this little boy looks sad. Why does he look sad? Oh, he's crying. What could have made him cry? How do you think his friends are going to respond to him? Just stopping to label emotions and emotional situations um, can be really effective for those younger kids who are still learning how to label and identify emotions. I need to add a disclaimer here before I go any further that I do not study, implement, or evaluate interventions on emotional competence. But because I know many of you in our audience do intervene directly with kids and families, I wanted to let you know that there are a lot of interventions out there to increase emotional competence in children. Because I don't actually uh, implement these myself, I can't answer questions about specifics, but the link down at the bottom here, and I also have a couple handouts myself of this PDF printed out if somebody, if people want them. Um, this is a great resource for, um, it lists a bunch of emotional competence interventions. Um, all of the references in terms of the evaluations that have been done on them and talks a lot more about the, the target populations and the, and the strategies there. But because they are so diverse, I just wanted to let you know that there are a lot of different options out there. Um, this first one is just among typically developing preschoolers. This PATHS program is a pretty um, common, popular program out of Penn State. And this is something that this can be delivered in a, in a classroom setting. And you'll notice down on content here, what are we focusing on? Emotion understanding, expression skills, and, uh, and controlling our negative emotions. So just like all the different components we talked about. I thought this one was interesting as well because here we're looking at, uh, we're not looking at typically developing preschoolers, we're looking at kids that have been diagnosed with oppositional defiance disorder or conduct disorder or ADHD or are showing early signs of behavior problems. This is uh, more appropriate for smaller groups delivered by mental, mental health professionals, but again, we're, we're working on understanding feelings, being empathetic towards other people and problem solving as well as anger management. And then, Finally, I wanted to show you this example too because this one we're actually targeting parents. Um, especially when we're talking about emotions here, a lot of our 
uh, a lot of how we feel about emotions and what should be expressed has to do with how we were parented, that whole ghost in the nursery idea. So um, this intervention actually targets parents of children birth to seven um, and smaller groups. And here we're looking at um, what are your experiences in your family of origin, parent-child interactions, parents' view of themselves and others, um, and how to help and facilitate emotion management in children. A bunch of resources and references. I just picked out a few, not to bog you down on, um, on the handout. This bottom one is that PDF on the interventions I was talking about. That is on the, the handout as well. And then finally, I just wanted to thank you all for attending, and thank you for everyone working with the Center for Children and Families for, for hosting. Thank you. Well, I think you're right that it, these responses really do vary based on cultural context and, and parents' beliefs. Um, and unfortunately, most of the research that's been done on what's the right response and what's related to positive outcomes for kids has been done with white families. So um, there has been a, a movement now, and I've tried to get in on that as well, about including more diverse samples and looking at not just what's the response that these parents use and how does that compare to white parents, but what are the beliefs that parents have about emotions and how does that relate to their practices. And then the next step is then, does this relate to different types of competence differently depending on the cultural context? So if parents have beliefs that um, it's more appropriate for you to suppress your negative emotions, um, is that adaptive? Is there a reason why parents are doing that? And so far, even though this is very early in the literature, so far it seems like yes, that parents, um, for the most part, have, have the right idea and that have the child's best interests in mind. And what we've been finding so far, especially among African American parents, is that they are worried that if their child expresses anger, out in public, they will be, um, they will receive harsher consequences in society because of that. So they will receive more discrimination and things like that, especially their boys. Um, and so if they encourage that child to suppress their negative emotions for that reason, um, is that an adaptive strategy? And early evidence suggests that, that yes, that can be adaptive. So I, I think you're incredibly correct that we need to consider the, the cultural context and what's appropriate. Um, or adaptive for that group. I think what's so nice about the Faber and Majlis book is that it gives you suggestions that can meet multiple goals at the same time. So sometimes the parent's goal is get the child to hush up, get them to stop crying right now, and they think shake it off is the way to do that. But Hyam Ganad and Faber and Majlis, you know, as clinicians, give us other suggestions. So instead of doing that, you can help the child calm down quickly by saying, oh, I'm so sorry, that must have hurt so badly. Here, let me rub it, you know. They suggest that we acknowledge how deep the feeling is so the child no longer has to convince us. So I think sometimes you can meet the suppression goal by being really warm and responsive as a parent and by showing them, I, I understand. You don't need to keep demonstrating for me. I know that really, really hurts. 
I think that's a great point. Yeah, the, just that little extra bit of patience or being in the moment and stopping just for a second to think about that child's needs. Seems like it could take longer, but actually might be more effective and get that your goal accomplished quicker than ignoring, ignoring the situation. It's not intuitively obvious. Sometimes the thing that helps the most is not where we go first mm -hmm. as parents and clinicians. And so I think these clinicians who've thought it through and have these practical suggestions give us such a gift in mm -hmm. strategies. Thank you. Yeah. Do you find that um, the research showed that uh, male versus female reaction, say a father versus the mother, does, are they similar regardless of the culture? In terms of reactions to kids' negative emotions? Is that what you were thinking? Yeah. <laughs> um, most of the research so far has found that fathers tend to be less supportive of children's negative emotions than mothers. Um, but we also need to think about how young children are socialized. These are messages that these men may have received their entire lives. So we know just from research on kids that parents spend less time talking about emotions with boys than they do with girls. So that tends to be more of a focus on their interactions with girls than it is with men, so, or with boys at that point. And then, and then we do see those differences differences later on. But these are just, just basic mean level differences though. There are, of course is a lot of individual variability in that. Yeah. Do you think that that, that difference in um, dealing with girls' emotions more than with boys comes out of some sort of belief that uh, the girls are feeling the emotions more mm -hmm. than the boys? I, I think there's just some odd um, kinds of things that may be under Right, I think, I think you're right, and it could be kind of a chicken or the egg, which yeah. came first, because um, if I spend more time talking to my daughter about emotions and I encourage her to share her feelings with me, she's, she understands she's going to feel like she's more comfortable in sharing her feelings, and then maybe I start to get the impression that she feels these emotions to a, I don't know, a more intense degree than my son does because he hasn't been encouraged to communicate that openly with me. <laughs> Can I ask a question? Yeah. I, 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 as you're talking, especially with the uh, findings on anxiety and maybe overregulation kinds of things, as you were talking about that, I wondered if what, what your perspective is on different biological propensities towards emotional experiences. You know, some people tend to be just sort of wired to experience anxiety and things like this. And it could be that because of that, they have learned these overregulation strategies rather than it being more of a co cause of these, you know, these kinds of um, more characterological differences. And I'm just wondering what your perspective is on that. I think that's a great point. And you're absolutely right that we need to look at the biology too and probably how the biology works along with the parenting and socialization influences kids are experiencing. The references I had here, the Calkins reference, uh, that actually is a study of vagal suppression. So that is a study looking at children's um, physiological regulation, what's going on on the inside. And that's where they found that children can over-regulate physiologically. So you're absolutely right that we have to look at the biological processes as well as what's going on in the environment. Thanks. Yes, sorry. Um, to your knowledge, is there any research done or do you know of emo like low emotional competence in childhood if it's tied to later uh, alexithymia? Like, people that have deficiency in describing their emotions, and I know that it's kind of a hallmark for certain psychopathology, like antisocial personality disorder and things like that. Do you know if there's, I mean, I would think that there's probably a, be a link that children that, you know, have low emotional competence later might have, you know, what's the idea there's deficient in describing their emotions? Yeah, I, I think I'm not as familiar with that, but I have a great resource for you, a chapter that I can, I can give to you um, that talks about that a bit more. But I think you're absolutely right that it's, 
and under, we talked about emotion vocabulary, so it's understanding these emotion terms and putting them in context myself and then being able to discuss them appropriately and, and use them in my vocabulary. So I think you're definitely on the right track, and I'm sorry I don't know a lot more about that, but I can definitely show you a resource for that. Yeah. Um, it seems like it brought some things to my mind in that period here, and that we're, we talk about the under and over regulators mm -hmm. and the anger and violence, and how the kids who have this situation aren't as good as regulated. So I'm thinking, for instance, my son's class, there's a kid in the class who has very, he's an over, I mean, an under regulator. He just can't control his emotions and stuff. And the reason that made me think of this is under the parental negativity and hostile environment, how that affects it. So my question is kind of linking those two. When there's a kid or more than one kid in a classroom, and I know there's always a grass and grass in the classroom, <laughs> how does that affect the other kids and their ability to learn or, or distract from the ability to learn on how to be much more emotionally? That is a really great question. <laughs> I can speculate, but I'm not familiar with research that's looked at kind of a contagion of poor regulatory skills. There actually is, there is some research, um, uh, done by Jay Belsky, uh, looking at the effect of having just a few more children with uh, clinical levels of, of behavior problems in class, you know, a difference between having two versus having six. Mm -hmm makes a difference to the whole class. Now, what kind of difference? Uh, more chaotic, more difficult to control, uh, disruptive of um, the learning that takes place there. Mm -hmm. So... Well, and you also, it's taxing on a teacher, too, so yeah. she's spending more, or he, she or he is spending more of their um, time and just emotional resources trying to attend to those children. Uh, Well, and it really is all connected, like we talked about. So um, the intellectual and the behavioral, if, if children aren't able to control themselves and attend to that, that information, they're not able to learn effectively either. Um, right. That's a great question, though. Thank you. I'm going to step in here. We don't want to stifle discussion, but I think we'll go ahead and stop the official um, question and answer. Please feel free to stay around and ask Dr. Nelson about the work and other ways. And thank you so much for coming. And thank you